This morning, we've been talking about this series for a few weeks. This morning, we start about a six-month walk through the book of Acts in a series that we're calling Unstoppable. As I read the book of Acts, I see the unstoppable nature of the gospel, the spirit, the mission, and the church. Unstoppable. Nothing will stop God's mission from unfolding. Unstoppable. So for six months about, there's 28 chapters in the book of Acts. We're going to go one chapter a week. No, I'm not going to preach on the whole chapter every Sunday. There will be a few Sundays where we touch on the whole chapter. But just like we walked through the Gospel of John, we took one chapter a week in the Gospel of John. We're taking one chapter a week in the book of Acts. And I want to encourage you, if you haven't grabbed one of the Scripture journals, grab a Scripture journal. Okay, so we can learn to read the Scripture with our Bible in one hand and a pen in the other. Where you can take notes, where you can write down questions, where you can jump into one of our small groups that meet on Thursday and two on Saturday. Where you can jump in and ask questions and be led through some guided discussion questions on the the book of Acts. The chapter that I have been preaching from and that hopefully you will have been reading. I think something special happens when the church unites in the word together. When the church is in the Word together in the same places and we focus all of our energies in our personal devotion time, in our small group time, and in our Sunday morning preaching time in the same text of Scripture, something happens because God works through His Word. And the book of Acts is the story of God's unstoppable gospel. How this small group of people turn the world upside down. They're promised the Holy Spirit. They receive the Holy Spirit. And in like 30 years, this small group of like maybe 100, 120 believers, this small group of people turn the world upside down in three decades. It's incredible. It's incredible. This hodgepodge of guys, this group of misfits, a tax collector named Matthew, a couple of fishermen, A couple of guys who were nicknamed the Sons of Thunder. Like, I don't know about you, but I would love for my brother and I to have been growing up being nicknamed the Sons of Thunder. Like, how awesome would you be if your nickname is the Sons of Thunder? Right? I mean, just think about it. Like, isn't that like, I'm going to work on Dylan and Sean Coase. And they're going to be, we're going to start calling them the Sons of Thunder because I think they're pretty awesome boys, right? Like, if you think they're pretty awesome, tell them after church today that they're pretty awesome, too. But, like, this, this random group of people, like, if I'm sitting down to write it, that's not the group of guys I'm going to pick. Let's just be honest. And then we throw in the Apostle Paul later. This random group of guys that God sovereignly calls, that God provides for, that God chooses, that God gives his spirit to, turn the world upside down. And think about this. Like, all of history is centered on the person of Jesus Christ. Like, how we tell time is centered on the person of Jesus Christ. Now, scientists are now trying to change it. Like, instead of before Christ, B.C., they're trying to rephrase that to B.C.E., before the Common Era. Because they don't like that. All of time is centered on the person of Jesus. You know what I say about BCE? I say it's nonsense. I say it's nonsense. Because the most important thing that has ever happened in the history of the world is Jesus. And I got no issue that he is the center of time. Jesus is the most important thing. And these these men and women and the church, given the Spirit of God, turned the world upside down like regardless of what you believe you cannot deny the fact that something happened in the Middle East about 2,000 years ago and the world has never been the same since something happened that is undeniable And as we look at this book as we take an extended period of time to walk through this book one chapter at a time I want us to keep in mind a couple of things. A couple of things we need to make sure we're all on the same page. Like, we could read the book of Acts pretty quickly. It's 28 chapters. Luke, although he used a lot of words, Luke writes like I speak. 
I speak with a lot of words sometimes. My wife is reminding me of that. Like I don't have to be as verbose sometimes when I talk. Luke writes pretty long chapters, but we could read the book of Acts in a little bit of time in the afternoon. We've got to keep in mind that these events unfold over about a 30-year period. So it's a story. It's a story. It's not every single thing that happens over that 30-year period. It's a story. And Luke gives us everything the Holy Spirit told him to write, everything that we need to know. It's also a narrative, and it's historical fact. The book of Acts actually happened. It's history. It's fact. It's a story. We also need to keep in mind that not everything we read in the book of Acts is is, still happens today. That there is a difference between Luke describing what happened and prescribing what should happen today. So we need to think about this. Now, there's description and prescription. Description tells us what happened. Historical fact. Prescription says you must do this. So we need to be careful as we read the book of Acts to be able to delineate between, uh, uh, to, to decide between what is prescribed and what is simply described. What we're going to see over the next six months as we, we do a deep dive as a church, our entire church, everything we do as a church centered around the book of Acts, we're going to see this incredible transformation of people that were literally running scared. Remember when we were in the Gospel of John, when a servant girl, probably Alexa's age, Alexa is 12, a servant girl, probably Alexa's age, looks to Peter and says, aren't you one of them? And Peter says, no, no, I never knew him. No, 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 not me. We're going to see this incredible transformation in men like Peter and men like the Apostle Paul and men like Stephen because something happened, something started in the Middle East with Jesus and it's unstoppable. We'll see how this group of people how they committed themselves to the word of God, how they committed themselves to the ministry of prayer, and how being empowered by the Holy Spirit, they turned the world upside down. We're going to see, hear me, like, hear this. Can I tell you a guaranteed church growth strategy? We're going to hear a guaranteed church growth strategy. Like, I could could write this in a book. I could sell a million copies to every church that wants to grow. Hear me, like, the guaranteed church growth strategy preach the book and pray. Preach the book and pray like your life depends on it. Because God is sovereign over his church, and we're going to see as Peter stands up and preaches, God adds to their number. Like, we don't need bouncy houses, we don't need snow cones, those are great. Those are great, whatever, that's fine. We don't even need professional quality music, even though we have professional quality music every Sunday at RCM. Here's the guaranteed church growth strategy that's worked for the last 2,000 years. Preach the book and pray like your life depended on it. Sorry. Not sorry. I'm not sorry at all for saying that. I just get a little excited and off script. That's what I'm apologizing for. We'll see that as the church declares the truth of the gospel, and hear me, when I say the church declares the truth of the gospel, there's an individual responsibility And there's a corporate responsibility. Individually, we share and show Jesus to every family we come in contact with. And we must use our words. Individually and corporately. Individually as followers of Christ and a church as a whole. Corporately, as we do that, as we declare the truth of the gospel, individually and corporately, God will add to our number. Because that's what he's been doing for the last 2,000 years. We will see how churches handle conflict. We'll see how church, churches raise up new leaders to deal with very real issues in their churches to allow the apostles to focus on preaching and praying. We'll see how God used suffering and continues to use suffering to advance his purposes in the world. 
we'll see this is this last point here we're going to see how a group of ordinary unnamed followers of Christ would plant this church that would then send out the greatest missionary team that Christianity has ever ever seen we're going to see how this this group of unnamed people plant this church at Antioch and the church at Antioch would send out Paul and Barnabas as they were praying and fasting the Holy Spirit said to them send out Paul and Barnabas so this group of unnamed people plant a church in Antioch and they get Paul and Barnabas in and the Holy Spirit says send them out as missionaries and they do it and Paul and Barnabas would be the greatest missionary team the church has ever seen So why would, why would Matt and I, your elder team, choose to spend the next six months working through the book of Acts? And here is, here is the goal. Here is the goal. My goal for every week, our goal for every week in the next six months, is that every single week God would use his word. God would use his word to push each of us individually and to push all of us together to greater levels of obedience. To greater levels of a reliance on His Spirit. A reliance on the Holy Spirit. To greater levels of involvement and commitment in God's mission. As we see that it really is unstoppable. It's unstoppable. Because each of us has a choice. We can choose to join God in his mission, or we can be disobedient. Like, that's the clearest way I can say it. You may say, Paul, you're harsh. No, I'm truthful. Like, we can choose to join God in his mission, or we can be disobedient. There's really no middle ground. And obedience, obedience looks differently for some of us. It really, obedience was going to look differently for all of us. Like, for Victoria and I, obedience looks like this. Raising up a family to love and honor Christ in our neighborhood in South Bradenton. Planting a church and open our home to anybody that needs help. That's what obedience looks like for Victoria and Paul Hilton. It also it, it, it involves the ministry of adoption. Where we've gotten to bring this incredible young man into our home as our son. And where, by God's grace, in about 18 months, we'll have the chance to bring another child into our home through the ministry of adoption. See, obedience for us looks like this. Obedience for you is going to look differently than obedience for Victoria and I. But just because it looks different doesn't mean it's not essentially, absolutely necessary and essential. Because we can choose to join God in his mission or we can choose to disobey. It's the straightest thing I can tell you today. When we join God in his mission, we will see that it is unstoppable unstoppable. So with all of this before us today, as we step out today is the first week in the book of Acts, looking at the unstoppable gospel spirit mission in church. I want to invite you to turn to Acts chapter 1, and I'm going to read verses 1 through 11. Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 11, and I read and teach and preach from the Christian Standard Bible, the CSB. It says this, I wrote the first narrative, Theophilus, about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up after he had given instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After he had suffered, he also presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over a period of 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. While he was with them, He commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but wait for the Father's promise, which, he said, you have heard me speak about, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit in a few days. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, are you restoring the kingdom to Israel at this time? He said to them, it is not for you to know times or periods that the Father has set by his own 
authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. After he had said this, he was taken up as they were watching, and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going, they were gazing into heaven, and suddenly two men in white clothes stood by them, and they said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up into heaven? This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come in the same way that you have seen him going into heaven. Will you pray with me this morning over God's word? Heavenly Father, God, you are good, and we love you, and we trust you. Lord, I pray... Father, I pray, God, I pray that your word would work in our hearts and minds today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So we see kind of the opening introduction that Luke gives us. The same man that wrote the Gospel of Luke also wrote the book of Acts. He says the first account, of, the first account was all that Jesus began to do and teach. He's talking about the Gospel of Luke, his first volume. See, Luke and Acts go together. It's like part one and part two. Uh, it's like the first half and the second half of a football game. Luke says, I wrote the first narrative, Theophilus, about all that Jesus began to do and teach. Now Luke is writing about what Jesus continues to do and, and teach through the Spirit, through the church, through the apostles, all in the book of Acts. Because he says, I wrote the first account of all that he began to do. Now I'm writing to you of all that he continues to do by the Spirit, through the apostles, through the church. And we need to see the the, the book of Acts as a continuation of the Gospel of Luke. It's part two, where part one focuses on Jesus' life and earthly ministry. Part two, the book of Acts, focuses on the unstoppable nature of the Gospel. The unstoppable nature of the Spirit of God, the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, the unstoppable mission of God, and God's unstoppable church as they engage with the gospel in the mission. It says in verse 2, until the day he was taken up after he had given instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. It says in verse 3, after he had suffered, he also presented himself. See, we have to see this. That Jesus was completely dead. After he had suffered, he also presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs. Like, the, the, the crucifixion of Jesus, historical fact, actually happened. Resurrection of Jesus, that God raised Jesus from the dead, historical fact, actually happened. Not just an idea, certainly not like alive at a group of guys who were uh, uh, kind of not the sharpest guys around not the strongest personalities around certainly not, not a lie that a group of guys who were running from, from servant girls by a fire a few days previous certainly not a, not a lie that a group of guys would have been able to keep together he appeared to many people here's what Paul would write in 1 Corinthians as we see the resurrection as a historical fact Paul would write, now I want to make clear for you, brothers and sisters, the gospel I preached to you, which you received, on which you have taken your stand, and by which you were being saved, if you hold to the message I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. He says, for I passed on to you, as most important, what I also received, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas. That's Peter. It's a different name for Peter. And he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to over 500 brothers and sisters at one time. Most of them are still alive. This is the Apostle Paul writing to the church of Corinth, 1 Corinthians. He's saying, like, most of the people he appeared to are still alive. Like, you don't believe me? Go ask them. Who did they see? But some have fallen asleep. Some have died, he's saying. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one born at the wrong time, he also appeared to me. That's Paul writing. The resurrection isn't a fairy tale. It really happened. And it's how and why 
we call other people to repent and believe because the resurrection really happened because Jesus conquered death Jesus conquered sin and he offers life because God raised Jesus from the dead it actually happened it's how and why we call people to repent and believe and experience life with Jesus for the kids in the room any of the kids study American history yet anybody know the Watergate scandal anybody remember that President Nixon, illegal wiretapping. Anybody, you guys remember that? High schooler, college student in the back. High schooler, how about high schooler, middle schooler? You guys remember in the back? No, high schooler, kinda? Watergate. Well, there was this dude that was thrown in jail because of Watergate. He played a part in it. And President Nixon, they illegally wiretapped the Democratic National Convention. If I'm getting my history right, I don't like history. Like, I got no use for history. I'm a math guy. But, so I'm going out on a limb here using an illustration from history. Okay? But this guy named Chuck Colson actually went to prison because of Watergate. He would become a Christian in prison. And here's what he said. He said, Watergate, this illegal wiretapping, this scheme... Watergate convinced me the resurrection was true. Seems kind of odd, right? How can illegal wiretapping, this, this scheme of the Nixon administration, how can that convince us that the resurrection is true? Here's what he said. Because he was an insider. He went to prison because of his role in it. He said, I saw firsthand some of the sharpest minds couldn't keep a secret, couldn't keep a lie going for much more than a week. How in the world could have a hodgepodge group of Middle Eastern fishermen, tax collectors, sons of thunder kind of guys. How could those guys have kept a secret, a lie going that would cost them their lives? Because they would be witnesses. They would die martyrs. He said, Peter, the same man, the same man who ran from a servant girl, probably about Alexa's age, the same man, Peter, when he saw his wife, this is tradition, not scripture, this is tradition. When he saw his wife be crucified for her faith, you know what he said to her? Remember the Lord. Remember the Lord. Talk about the power of the resurrection. Talk about the power of the resurrection. The life that Peter had when he got the Holy Spirit, the life that Jesus gave him points him to see his dying wife and he encourages her and he says, remember Jesus. You know, Peter, when it was time for him to be killed, church history tells us that he felt it would be inappropriate for him to die the same way Jesus did. So they crucified him upside down. Probably the only thing worse than dying by crucifixion is to be put upside down on a cross we're going to see the apostles willingness to die for their faith is an incredible evidence of the reality of the gospel the reality of the cross the reality of the resurrection in verses 4 and 5 he says while he was with them he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem but to wait for the father's promise the promise which he said you have heard me speak about this is Jesus they had heard him speak about the promise and here's the promise for John baptized with water but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit in a few days sent to the apostles in just a few days the promise of the Holy Spirit and now dwelling within every single believer See, this is, this is one of those areas where we have to decide between what is normal and what is not normal. What, is, is what Luke is describing rather than what he's prescribing. So we can't use this to say there's this second baptism. I believe the whole of the New Testament says the moment of conversion, you are given the Holy Spirit. The moment you believe, the moment you are converted, you are baptized with the Holy Spirit. The apostles waited for Pentecost ten days later. The apostles would be baptized with the Holy Spirit, given the Holy Spirit. Now, the 
Holy Spirit dwells in every single believer. If you have turned from your sin and are trusting in Jesus, you have the Holy Spirit in you as a guarantee. But as of this writing, as of the time Luke is writing, these words that Jesus is saying, the Holy Spirit's ministry had yet to been fully unleashed individually to the people of God. Jesus had promised them time and again that the Father would send the Spirit. He says, you spend the Counselor, the Counselor, which I promise you, he's promised them the Holy Spirit. He's going to come. And it's the promise that gives them power. He tells them to wait for it because he's coming in a few days. And if, if they tried to complete God's mission apart from the Holy Spirit, they would have failed. If they tried to complete God's mission apart from the Holy Spirit, they would have failed. And let me tell you, sometimes the hardest things we have to do is wait. Is wait. Jesus appears to them, this group of people, no chance they'd last without the Spirit of God. Jesus says, wait. I've promised him to you. Wait. The Father will send him. He's coming. The Holy Spirit is coming. Don't get out ahead of it. Wait for the Spirit to come. Christian, I want to encourage you right now. If you have turned from your sin and are trusting in Jesus, I tell you on the authority of God's word, you have the Holy Spirit inside of you. The moment you first believed, you were baptized with the Holy Spirit. You have the Spirit of God, the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. You have that inside of you. That's how we can obey. That's the only way we can obey. And that is such good news. But there was still some confusion. These guys were still confused. We see that in verse 6. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, are you restoring the kingdom to Israel? And they were undoubtedly thinking back in Ezekiel chapter 36 and Joel chapter 2, where God had promised to restore the kingdom, that, how, where God had given this promise about pouring out his spirit. Like this is what Jesus is talking to them about. But they still didn't quite understand that God's kingdom, as Jesus said to them, is not of this world. That he's not ushering in a military and political kingdom, but instead a spiritual kingdom. The rule and reign of Jesus through the church. The rule and reign of Jesus for the church. And in responding, as they say, hey, are you restoring the kingdom? He says, it's not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power. You will receive power. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses. Hear me. They were given power. They were promised the power of the Holy Spirit for a purpose. Now, I don't like to alliterate. It just happened that way. I really don't like alliteration. I like to joke about alliteration. I do not like to alliterate when I preach, but it works here. Power. They would receive power for a purpose. See, that goes, that's pretty good, right? Most alliteration is cheesy and forced, but that's not too bad, right? John Sweeney in the back row is giving me the thumbs up, or nod his head anyway. Think about that. Powered for a purpose. Now, who has power in their home? Like electricity, like power, right? We get a power bill. I hope we got power in my home because we get the power bill. Who has FP&L running power or Peace River Electric Co-op running power or somebody running electricity to your home? It's all right to raise your hand. It's okay. So we all do, right? We all have power in our home. And now, do we have electricity in our home just to say, hey, I got electricity? No, that's absurd, right? Like, we have electricity in our home. Can I tell you the most important thing that our... That, are, that, are, that, are, that, are, that the FPNL powers in our home? The coffee maker. Amen. That's right. I got an amen. We have power in our home for a purpose. That's to use things, to do things, to be productive, right? For my kids to charge their iPads and their laptops and their phones and their Xboxes and their TVs or whatever. The most important thing in our home that's powered is the, well, it's probably the air conditioner. If we're just being honest, right? Because I can still go to Starbucks and get coffee. Probably the most important thing is the air conditioner. Secondly, maybe the hot water heater. For the first three days we lived in our home, we didn't think we had hot water in the master shower because our, our faucet had been plumbed backward. And that first day when we realized we do have hot water in the master shower, it was glorious to take a hot 
shower, right? But we have, we have power for a purpose. We don't have power just to pay FP&L a tax every month or, or the Peace River Electric Co-op, wherever you live. We have power to use things, to, to enjoy things, to do things in our home. The power that God promises us the power that Jesus promises the apostles here, the, pa- the power that Jesus promises us through the, the scriptures, that we will receive power from the Holy Spirit is for a purpose. It's to be obedient to God as we participate with his mission. It's to be obedient to God as we participate in his mission because our obedience is impossible apart from the power to obey the power of the holy spirit in our lives and jesus says look you guys can't do anything in your own like the the last few weeks has proven that right you say like seriously pete like you're not you're not knocking it out of the park but that's okay you will receive power when the holy spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses That word witness has the same root word as we have in our English language, martyr. They come from the same word, witness, martyr. Here's the role of a witness. They share the truth. They share the truth. Anybody ever have to testify in court or in a deposition? It's a horrible experience. I had to get deposed once, and my boss is at the bank. Like, I didn't do anything wrong. Like, two clients suing each other. My bosses at the bank refused to allow me to bring an attorney in the deposition with me. I'm like, feed me to the lions, guys. Thanks. It's a horrible experience. But the role of a witness is just to share the truth. To share the truth. Not to fabricate the truth. Not to emotionalize the truth. But just share information. Share information. He says... Once the Spirit comes, you'll be my witnesses. In Jerusalem, it's where the gospel starts. In all Judea and Samaria, it's where the gospel spreads. And to the end of the earth, which is where the gospel is going. And can I tell you, like, we're all here this morning because people have obeyed that call. We are here this morning because people receive the power of the Holy Spirit at the moment of conversion. The Spirit comes on them. And they realize that power is for a purpose. To point other people to Jesus. And someone shared Jesus with someone else. With someone else. With someone else. And eventually shared Jesus with you. Can I tell you why I'm here this morning? Because someone invited my great granny to a revival in the mountains of West Virginia in an era where there wasn't anything else to do. And my granny Belcher brought her daughter and son-in-law to that same revival. And their lives were never the same ever since. And my grandparents would have my mother. And I could tell the same story on my father's side but you get my point, and my parents would get married, and they would share and show Jesus to me every day of my life, even when I was running long and hard from it. They never gave up. They were obedient. And that's why I'm here this morning. That's why I have breath this morning, because apart from the grace of God, I would not have made it to 43. But they received power for a purpose, and they were obedient. Will you be? Will you be? Will you be? Just like we don't say, hey, I'm awesome. I got power in my house. I pay a tax to FPL, but I'm not actually going to use it. Will you be obedient? Will you see the reason you have breath? The reason you have breath is to follow God in his mission. And his mission is unstoppable. As we share and show Jesus to people, 
people in our neighborhoods, people in our schools, people in our workplaces. We share and show Jesus. We are a witness. We testify. I can't remember. I, I, I can't stop thinking about this story in the Gospel of John where Jesus meets this lady in the middle of the day, this social outcast, and he has this dialogue with her, and her life is forever changing. You want to know what her witness was? Come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Christ? Like, you don't need to know the books of the Bible in order. I still get mixed up sometimes in the minor prophets, just saying. I have to go, Isaiah, Joel, uh, you know. You don't need to know every verse, every chapter. You don't need to know the four spiritual laws. You don't need to be able to draw diagrams in the sand. All of those are good things. Here's what you do need to know. You need the power of the Holy Spirit, and you need to be willing to share it with people. Come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Christ? Let me tell you the difference Jesus has made in my life, and let's explore together who Jesus is. That's all you need to be willing to do. Are you willing to do it? Are you willing to? To do it because at the end of the day, your witness is about Jesus. My witness is about Jesus. It doesn't have to be complicated. We just need to share it and show it to people with the power of the Holy Spirit. Because God's mission is unstoppable. With or without you, God's mission is unstoppable. With or without Paul Helton, God's mission is unstoppable. Will you join him in it? Will you join him in it? The first step, the first step, the first step is conversion. The first step is when we turn from our sin and turn to Jesus, where we repent and believe. That is the first step. Before God will ever use you, you must turn from your sin and believe trust in Jesus alone. A few months ago, I had this incredible privilege of baptizing a young lady in our church. And the language we used as I was talking with her, as she, she prayed to turn from her sin and trust in Jesus, as she asked God to give her new life in Jesus' name, the language that we used was getting on Team Jesus. And as I put this young lady under the water, this incredible young lady, I said, she has decided she wants to be on Team Jesus. See, that's the entry point. Are you on Team Jesus this morning? Have you ever come to a place in your life and when you turned from your sin, your sin, and turning to Jesus to find life? That's the starting point. And whether you're watching online, whether you're in the room, each of us needs to do that. And I don't mean like, well, I've always gone to church, so of course I'm on Team Jesus. I don't mean like, well, I was confirmed at 12, and of course I'm on Team Jesus. I don't mean like, well, I come from a Christian home, of course. Or I don't even mean like, well, my dad's the pastor, of course I'm on Team Jesus. Health and kids. I mean, have you personally come to a place in your life where you have turned from your sin and are trusting in Jesus alone. Because as we're going to see in a few weeks, there is salvation in no other name. If that's not you today, if, you're, if, if you need to talk more about that today, if that's you, you're in this role where I, I haven't really done that, Paul. I want to ask you, hit us up. Shoot us a message, a private message to the church on our Facebook account. Hit me up on email, text me, call me, go to our webpage. You can find my email address. You can find my phone number. Do not let your head hit the pillow tonight without reaching out and saying, Paul, I need to know more about being on Team Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, I pray. God, we love you. God, I pray that every person that hears this message today would know for certainty that they are yours. And Father, I pray that each, each that hears this message, hears this service today, Father, would say yes. By your power, by your spirit, I will obey. It's in Jesus' name.